And so this is the second uh, lecture for this round, for this year of the Share SFPI. And uh, discussing, as yesterday, I, I discussed the, um, basically the inter-firm relationships, inter-firm networks, and the, basically the role of communication in shared or collective learning towards basically facilitating a sustainable transition because firms are dealing with the future that is unknown and these are events that we're not that we're not exposed to in the past so today i wanted to deal with the problem of firm succession and the social implications and of firm succession and alternatives to trade sales mergers and acquisitions which is a very long title but um so the basic structure i will first set up the context then talk about the types of conversions that exist, and then mention some case studies just very briefly, and emphasizing the social implications thereof, and then later go into the alternatives that exist and that are emerging now as to what uh, the owners of firms can do. And then in the end, I will talk about the role that sovereign wealth funds like the SFPI can play in actually intermediating these alternatives. So just to remind, this is my summary a uh, picture of the summary of my predecessor, Max Krahe's work. Max Krahe was the prior chair of SFBI, and he discussed basically the macro dynamics of sustainable finance from the development of taxonomies, like the EU taxonomy and the implications these have on investors, on uh, firms, and on the ability to report uh, on these uh, via sustainability accounting. And my work is very much centered on the gray circle basically on firms themselves. And yesterday I talked about the interrelations between firms, firm networks like the Pôle de Competitivité, clusters and other networks like the Shift and so on, and what they're doing towards this. And in this case, in this talk, I will be talking about the individual firm. So looking at one particular firm in its life cycle. <coughs> so looking at the firm as an ecosystem, I think is a very useful tool in this sense. And the firm can be seen as a, as a network of structured individuals, meaning we do have individuals in firms that have agency, that have choices, that make choices. But at the same time, uh, they are structured within the dynamics of the firm. For instance, the, the goal of keeping the firm alive is, is one that structures the agency of those individuals. And it can be seen also as a firm-specific network, meaning that the firm itself, what we call the firm, extends beyond the legal domain of the firm. So it's also a community that involves the suppliers, the clients, uh, others, um, even citizens, workers, and so on, investors, etc. Um, there is a tradition looking at the external control of organizations, looking at firms as basically choreographers of, well, not choreographers, but they're working within uh, constraints. So and those constraints often are external. It's the environment. The environment is given for a firm. And uh, Pfeffer, Jeffrey Pfeffer and uh, Selnick in their book, uh, The um, External Control of Organizations, were very pivotal in this. And uh, in fact, there are different traditions and different perspectives of viewing the role of an entrepreneur or somebody who founds a firm. So there's agency theory on the one hand, which sees, uh, for instance, if I'm selling a firm, a divergence of interests or if I have workers in the firm, a divergence of interests and information between the entrepreneur and the, um, and for instance, um, um, the private equity or workers or others. There's the stewardship notion, which actually attributes an int intrinsic uh, uh, motivation to entrepreneurs towards, for instance, a community. So they're not instrumentally motivated by uh, profit, but also they have a sense of responsibility towards the community. And this isn't necessarily the case with successors. So the later generation of firm managers is not necessarily as um, connected. So then there's also the socioeconomic wealth perspective, which actually looks more at the reputation that uh, owners or entrepreneurs have. So they, they would like to keep the, the, the reputation of being a patron of the community. And again, there's a difference between this very direct connection to that reputation towards uh, uh, or rather vis-a-vis, -vis, for instance, later generations or private equity or other later owners of a firm. They may not have any uh, relation towards this, um, this reputation. Now, a firm as an ecosystem means we need to view it as in the sense of a life cycle. 
You know, any living organism, any ecosystem has a birth, a life, and a death. Many entrepreneurs don't plan for what happens after they, they get out of a firm. So this is a, actually, I'm working on a chapter with an ecologist on, on these notions. And there is this very interesting study, The Living Company by Ari de Gus, uh, which actually started as a commission by Royal Dutch Shell to study long living firms. And actually they found that the average life expectancy of Fortune 500 firms is only 40 to 50 years. So in fact, the companies that we see as successful today may not even be successful. They might not even exist in, in a few years. So again, Firms are part of networks. This is, each of these dots is one firm, but each of the dots is itself also a network. And that's what I will be focusing on today. Looking at the Belgian context, there are a few large players in Belgium like uh, Anheuser-Busch, InBev, Solvay, a few other large firms. But actually the interesting thing is if you look at the statistics, more so than other countries in Europe, Belgium is dominated by small and medium enterprises. So you see the statistics here. In fact, most of the wealth creation is happening, or the value added, the employ employment, by far the largest amount is happening not in the large companies, but in small and medium enterprises. So it, there is twice as much employment in the small enterprises, medium enterprises, and a third more value added. And specifically, the family-owned firms also face certain problems of succession. So. Uh, I will just read as international evidence shows suitable fam family internal successes. So if you have a son or a daughter or a cousin or someone who will follow you with the will and ability to take on ownership and management of family firms seem to be the exception rather than the rule. Reasons include successors enhanced career options or uh, increased individualism and the circumstance that family firms and many smaller private firms compared to other uh, employers um, are mainly smaller, excuse me, compared to other firms. Hello. And therefore, it's important for family firms to study alternative succession routes other than a handover to family members. And so the rest of this talk will be about what those alternatives are. <laughs> and the most common, of course, we see, this is the menu. I wanted to put some moule, moule frit here, but I forgot to put that there uh, since we're here in Belgium. Uh, we have private equity takeovers. We have also managerial buyouts. We have mergers and acquisitions. And then there's what I call the drifting into irrelevance. I will get into all these in detail, and then maybe there are some other ones. So first is private equity. Uh, fa family firms actually constitute an important deal source for private equity, of course, because there are so many. Uh, there's considerable potential for conflict at the same time, as I mentioned in this agency, uh, because family firms and private equity may follow very different business philosophies, and family firms are known to have long term perspectives on the business and often pursue non-financial goals, whereas private equity firms buy businesses in order typically to resell them at a profit. And uh, furthermore, private equity firms have been widely criticized for unsustainable performance effects on or in portfolio firms. So a private equity deal usually has three different phases. There's the pre-deal phase, the deal phase, and the post-deal phase. And the pre-deal phase involves finding basically a buyer and a seller and of course, the question of why sell is, as I mentioned, there is problems with succession of an entrepreneur and as well, there may be problems with profitability. So a company may be declining in profitability or maybe even going into debt such that it's unsustainable and the entrepreneur has to sell. And at the same time for private equity, there is a large pool of businesses. As I mentioned, most of the businesses in, in Belgium, for instance, are small and medium enterprises. And these businesses at the same time are lacking capital for expansion. So private equity can be, uh, so to speak, a handmaiden in that. So after the pre-deal phase, there is the deal phase with contracts and valuation and pricing. And then, of course, uh, there is the post-deal phase, which involves uh, perhaps a new governance structures or the and also involves the long-term success of the business, which this last phase is what I will focus on. And the results, if you look at the research, uh, is, is ambiguous. So there is professionalization and strategic positioning in firms after a private equity buyout, which in many cases improves the sustainability, financial sustainability of firms. Uh, but however, studying stock listed Italian family firms Vivani and co-authors found empirical evidence that private equity backed family firms underperform non-private equity backed fa family firms and as well as underperforming industry benchmarks like Mibtel. 
And in Spain, similarly, family firms with majority and controlling investors show no difference in growth rates compared to non-family venture capital-backed firms. So the, the results are not always clearly, so to speak, an improvement over the status quo ante. In fact, private uh, equities often characterize as being short-term driven and more likely to initiate divestitures, divestitures excuse me, uh, employee layoffs and production relocations after investing in a family firm. So the decision making is often moved somewhere abroad to New York or London or Tokyo and so on. Not always, but there is a tendency. And of course, then there is also the question what happens after private equity exits? So it's usually not a permanent solution. At the same time, I was just reading an article in the Financial Times from two or three days ago, uh, you know, 22nd of October, so I guess four days ago, and which uh, quoted the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Singapore, saying it's one of the most important investors in the world, of course. It warned in July of this year that a golden age for the buyout industry has ended. And in fact, the article suggested that private equity firms face the worst year this year for exiting investments in a decade. So. There is some volatility, of course, with rising interest rates that creates, again, more tensions and agency problems there. So connected to private equity is uh, management buyouts, which are often facilitators of these. So I wanted to connect these two topics. And you find in the history of you know, economic thought, Burl and Means in their famous book from 1934, and Joseph Schumpeter and his Capitalism, uh, Socialism and Democracy, I think is the name of the book, they talk about so-called managerial capitalism. So moving away from entrepreneurs and owners rather to managers having more and more agency and power over, so to speak, the operations and the strategy of companies. So in fact, these management buyouts have been increasingly practiced since 1975. It's about this time that they, that they began, although there were some cases even back to the Industrial Revolution where managers uh, like Robert Owen, who I was talked about yesterday, bought out the owners. But the phenomenon of a management buyout really increased, um, as you see here, uh, in the 70s, statistically. So management buyouts, buyouts in a chapter on the history in this uh, Rutledge uh, Companion to, 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 to manage your buyouts, a very interesting book, uh, arose from conglomerate groups' decisions to divest their sub subsidiaries. The impetus for these sales came from the increasing fragmentation of vertical supply and value chain. So in part, this was uh, influence not caused by the oil crisis of the 1970s as well, which led to a lot of uncertainty. And sometimes companies wanted to reduce that and managers were there with some capital to take over the companies. So again, they, they kind of drop off after 2008. You see that it significantly decreases and even later further decreases. And so it's become a little bit uh, less popular. And I can't see this. Uh, so in fact, it's uh, the... Uh, Private equity, of course, as I mentioned, accompanies these, facilitates them, and it says here there's an the existence of an equity gap, which you can't see. And so particularly, private equity has helped to close the equity gap, but apparently the equity gap still continues to exist, particularly for small, smaller firms you see here. They are usually less able to um, accumulate interest by private equity or others for these kinds of these kinds of buyouts. And again, it's it's they're they're falling off, and probably as again interest rates now are increasing and the cost of money is is increasing, you will see probably less of these management buyouts. So two examples uh, from recent history. One is United Airlines, one of the largest uh, airlines I think in the United States, number two as far as I know. Um, they, there was an, in a, a buyout initiated by the pilots who tried over several instances for, for one of these. Uh, in 1989, I think was the first attempt, it was not successful. In 1994, together with the machinist union, the pilots together purchased 45% uh, of the company, 10% for the rest of the uh, uh, salaried employees, including the uh, flight staff, for instance, um, flight crew. And there is, in fact, as you see, uh, quite a divergence in the stake of the pilots and the machinists and the flight staff. And in fact, the, the wage uh, differential is quite high. So this is why a lot of the management buyouts occur because uh, higher ranking members of firms usually have more, so to speak, excess uh, income or excess wealth. Um, this is why the, why, why, whereas there are more 
uh, a flight crew at United, they in total had much less to, to add. So in fact, their contribution of the flight staff was uh, labor was a labor contribution. It took the form of wage cuts <coughs> and uh, promised productivity gains. And uh, well, it did again maintain its relationships with external capital suppliers to finance the transaction. And so again, there was an involvement of external finance in this case. And they created a very complex board structure, which is very interesting. And I, I don't want to get into, to, into too much detail because there are other topics to discuss. However, the, the company went bankrupt nevertheless in 2002. So it's currently not owned by in this, in, anymore in this, in this structure. So this was a, um, you could say, not la non-lasting. It lasted, I suppose, eight years. Elisphere is a French company that actually provides market information on companies' viability, on things like um, corporate social responsibility. And again, for uh, creditors and others who want to see, uh, is this company one that I, that I would like to invest in? And has a long tradition. It goes back over 100 years and was a, actually a company that provided insurance for overseas investment. There was a management buyout that was promulgated in 2008. And uh, in fact, Again, via private equity, in this case, the current ownership is that 10 managers. I spoke with the CEO um, um, in September, uh, a very interesting woman, uh, and it's 10 managers own one third of the company. A further 1% is owned by employees, very small amount, because it's a very successful and very large company. And it's very difficult to, uh, on the one hand, motivate employees to become involved and then the stakes are so high that it's very difficult for employees from the savings that they have to, to, to become involved. And the rest, again, is owned by three different private equity firms. And in fact, they, they even only arrived at this 1%, which in fact, if you have a certain amount of percent of ownership, there has to be employee representation on the board. So I think 3% in France. Um, there's a profit sharing arrangement in, in France that actually uh, allows uh, tax deduction and contributions uh, on the part of firms that are, again, tax deductible. So they can actually match the contributions that employees make. So even if they have a small amount of, of excess income or wealth, that can be matched by, um, again, the company and it's tax deductible. Uh, I'll come back to this again. So the mergers and acquisitions <laughs> is probably something that people are more aware of, although it's actually much rarer. And as to why, companies merge or acquire other companies. A lot of it has to do with security or perceived security. Companies feel that if they diversify their product line or if they have more vertically integrated supply chains or further scope in products, that they will be more resilient against market downturns. And there are other examples like technological or product development, so-called synergies. So just as one example here from um, a book by um, Dees and, and, and co, they talk about the Allied Signal and Honeywell merger, which basically brought together a lot of different scientists and big budgets in the two companies that could be put together for developing more, more products. Um, they, as they say here, performance materials and control systems. Just, that's just an example. And of course, a merger and an acquisition are not the same thing. A merger, of course, is when one firm buys another, either through stock purchases or the issuance of debt. And a merger, on the other hand, of course, entails the combination or consolidation of two firms or of more firms to form a new legal entity. But of course, as they comment here, they're typically treated very similarly because the outcome is very similar, even if the method is different. Now, the resulting firms are usually multi-dimensional. Uh, excuse me, dimensional, divisional, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm, we're not breaking the laws of physics. <laughs> They're multi-divisional. And um, in that you're combining literally two or more hierarchies of firms. And this creates a very interesting dynamic where firms perceive through this shared ownership a neat streamline based on the perception of redundancy. We have two different uh, finance departments. We have two different R&T departments. So, so what ends up happening is that firms switch again from a uh, a functional structure that you see on the top here to a divisional structure, which has quite a few redundancies. And it involves a separation of strategic and operational control, provides the corporation with enhanced ability to respond to changes because you have a lot of redundancy. At the same time, this is perceived, as I mentioned, to be expensive 
So you have duplication of personnel. And so companies sometimes uh, actually want to shift away from this model. It promotes uh, sometimes a dysfunctional, as it said, competition among divisions, since each division tends to become concerned about its operation. So you're creating actually competition with, within a company, and that creates a sense of a zero-sum game. And one firm where this was extremely the, the case was a Sears, Sears and Roebuck, uh, which actually created a very negative environment um, that actually led to its collapse, its um, bankruptcy. So getting away from the divisional structures, some companies have experimented with so-called matrix structures. And this involves a combination of the, and I, I will mention a case study uh, in a moment, uh, of a combination of functional and divisional structures. And so basically you're combining, again, functional departments with product groups on a project basis. So you're creating these dual hierarchies. And in the end, um, basically people work in different projects and since you're the individuals who work in a matrix organization become responsible to two managers, um, the project manager and the manager of their functional area. So for instance, if you're working in marketing, you're reporting to the marketing head and also the project head of the project that you're working on. So it's very, a complex structure and it means that a lot of resources are shared instead of duplicating. And basically the idea was to get beyond this divisional structure that is duplicating a lot of functions. But in practice, it can be a disaster. So the dual reporting structures can result in uncertainty and lead to intense power struggles and conflict over the allocation of personnel and other resources. Working relationships become more complicated and it may result in excessive reliance on group processes and teamwork, along with a diffusion of responsibility, uh, which in turn may erode timely decision making. So you pass the hot potato, so to speak, uh, instead of making certain uh, decisions and feeling responsible, you say it's someone else's responsibility and you are creating a kind of a fiefdom, a feudal structure in many, in many cases in practice. So in terms of the statistics on mergers and acquisitions, they are not very good. And there are a number of studies that have studied hundreds of different companies over, over decades. And so here is one that's mentioned, a study that revealed that the stock market reaction of 600 acquisitions over the period between 1975 and 1991 uh, indicated that the acquiring firm suffered an average 4% drop in market value. At the same time, another study studying US companies from 1997 onwards, uh, over $15 billion found that the stocks of the acquiring firms have on average underperformed the S&P stock index by 14% and their own uh, peer group by four percentage points. So they are less profitable. And then another study that actually studied 270 mergers between 2000 and 2003 uh, in multiple countries and regions found that the sales growth decreased by 6% and that earnings growth dropped by almost 10% and market valuation declined by 2.5%. So in the last study that investigated 86 completed takeovers between 1993 and 2008 found a negative return of 2% per month in the long-term performance in a three-year um, period after the acquisition. So statistically speaking, it's not a good thing for companies. There are, of course, exceptions. So looking at recent history, this is a German um, cosmetics firm, Goldwell. Uh, uh, I should say... Um, my partner was the head of human resources here for many years. Uh, so um, it was founded in 1948 by Hans-Erich Dotter in Darmstadt in Germany, which is known for chemical manufacturing there. And he developed a cold perm and found that you know, women after the war, they want to look pretty again. So we have to provide some kind of products. And so they, he developed relationships, direct relationships with hairdressers and even received a kind of a, a um, acknowledgement or support by the Guild of Hairdressers in Darmstadt. And so this was how the company grew by building personal relationships. And they had an employee retention rate of more than 15 years on average. But uh, Dota had no heirs. So and he wanted to basically ensure that the that the company provided value for the, the region and for his, his home, his hometown. I think it's gone off. No. Oh, this one? Okay, so this is fine? Ah, okay. Well, I keep talking. We had some technical issues today. Many issues. Sorry about that. No problem. Give it this? Yes. See. Um, and so he wanted to actually create a foundation to provide value for the 
for the local community and uh, was looking for a buyer. And so there were multiple offers, even by Schwarzkopf, a, a competitor. And in the end, the best offer came from a Japanese firm, Kao, uh, which is, is, is a conglomerate in the, in the cosmetics uh, field. And uh, Dota went with this, this uh, company because the Japanese firms are usually very soft or take a hands-off approach with supposedly with the firms that they acquire. And it was interested in expanding into the European market. And also they offered cash. So that was also very convincing. And he remained the chairman of the board uh, for an indeterminate time. And there was very little change, in fact, in personnel at first. So over the, the next 15 years, there were very little, very few changes. And, and in fact, many employees didn't even know that they were working now for a Japanese company. And uh, but just in two departments in finance and marketing, there were some changes. So basically aligning more with, with Japan. And, uh, and then at the turn of the century of the millennium, so around 2000, uh, Cal purchased Andrew Jurgens, the American firm, and then began implementing more uh, what you might call American style management practices, including uh, employing a matrix structure. So that means that decision-making changed and there were some actual, um, well, I can't see it here, the surveys of employees that they conducted every three or to four years that found that employees found the new structure was less effective and uh, there was less communication. There was uh, low accountability sometimes for decisions. So others would say, I'm not responsible. It's not my responsibility. There were layoff waves, including 60% of the finance department. And it made actually professional development more difficult, even though it was supposed to make it easier. So the, the idea was now we are international, you can go abroad. But in fact, the US companies or the Japanese companies didn't hire people from Europe generally. And the heads of the finance department were all British. So it, it was seen to be, again, by employees to be quite ineffective. The marketing over time became standardized, which in fact led to confusion on the part of clients because they didn't recognize the product anymore, which led to a loss of revenue. And uh, in fact, one of the most interesting developments was the, the loss of the, the partial loss of brand exclusivity. As I mentioned, there was a personal relationship with hairdressers. So you could only get these products by going to the hairdresser. You could not buy them in stores. But the company changed this policy outside of Germany. So in fact, you could go to Switzerland and go to any kind of store and buy them in, in the store. So many customers thought, why am I going to pay more to go to the hairdresser if I can just cross the border and get it cheaper? So this created a lot of frictions even in the relationships with hairdressers. Uh, the third or the, the next um, possible succession is doing nothing, uh, is as I call it, drifting into irrelevance. And in fact, there are companies that sometimes forget the focus on long-term value and that miss opportunities for change. And if they are engaged in short-termism or they're not taking any risk or supporting bottom-up experimentation, it leads to quite poor prospects and less innovation and perhaps even undercutting the firm's reason for existence, its raison d'etre. And one example of this, I would say, is General Motors, which in fact over the years shifted more and more towards being a sh what's called a shadow bank in the literature. So in fact, up until 2008, they were making more money and had a larger, so to speak, unit giving auto loans than they had producing cars. So actually the banking component of, of GM was larger than, than their production unit. And in fact, similarly, they, they did not only fail, they didn't fail to invest in electric vehicles. General Motors created the first commercially viable electric vehicle in, I think, 1996. It was the EV1. But they felt that the car was competing with their own gasoline-powered cars. So in fact, in the end, they repurchased the cars and destroyed them. And there are only a few left that they gave to museums. So in fact, uh, there's actually a documentary film, Who Killed the Electric Car, about this very perverse event. So in fact, they missed that trend. Now Tesla, of course, is, is worth more on the market than most of the other auto companies combined. GM could have been in that position. In 2008, there was a financial crisis, of course, and GM was bankrupt and it was purchased by the government and it meant restructuring. There are many sacrifices by the workers, including uh, wages, benefits, pensions, and so on. And um, they have returned to profitability recently, uh, but And now they're investing $7 billion in a uh, electric vehicle production unit. And it seems to me, this is just my opinion, it's, it's a little bit too late. So 
For instance, China has dominated the entire supply chain of batteries all the way to the production of, of cars. And you have even competitors in the US like Tesla. So it, it seems a little bit late. And in fact, there's the largest current wave of strikes in the auto industry's history are currently ongoing with, with even you know, Joe Biden joining the striking workers. Um, I mean, I don't know if you can read this quote. He says, you made a lot of sacrifices you gave up a lot and the companies uh, were in trouble and now they, they're doing incredibly well. And guess what? You should be doing incredibly well too. It's a simple proposition. It's just about being fair. Folks, stick with it. The strike, he means, because uh, you deserve the significant raise you need and other benefits. So let's get back to work and so on and so forth and so forth. Another company that really drifted into relevance literally is Kodak. Um, I, I'll just read this. I think it's very fascinating. In 1981, Sony released the Sony Mavica, a prototype of the electronic camera. Kodak had every ability to respond. After all, it had invented the digital camera in 1975 and held patents for it. But it was too tempting to stick with the status quo film. Uh, Kodak was the clear market leader and its sales had crossed $10 billion that year, nearly all from film. Why change? A study by Kodak's head of market intelligence uh, predicted that uh, digital would replace film, but this displacement would take 10 years, far too long to bother doing anything about. Kodak took no action, unlike, unlike its rivals, Avco, for instance, or Fuji. Uh, uh, Kodak's inertia was an era of omission that led to bankruptcy in 2012, a huge fall from grace as Kodak had been worth $31 billion at its peak and employed 150,000 people. So, and so on and so forth. Um, this is from Alex Edmonds' 2021 book, Grow the Pie. Very interesting case study in basically companies succeeding into nothing. Back to this study that I mentioned about the living company. Uh, again, this was commissioned originally by Royal Dutch Shell, which was trying to find out why do certain companies live, so to speak, much longer or last much longer than others. And they were looking at companies that actually were even older than Royal Dutch Shell and trying to find out what were the characteristics that they displayed. And actually they find that long-lived companies are basically very sensitive to their environment. It doesn't matter if they are based on knowledge, like they say DuPont is, or if they're based on natural resources, such as the, you know, the uh, uh, Shell, <laughs> for instance, or here they mentioned the Hudson Bay Company. Uh, it is being in harmony with the world around them that, that matters, that distinguishes the long-lived companies. They're also cohesive. They have a sense of identity. And uh, here, in fact, there's strong employee links that are essential for survival and for change. And there's, in fact, a cohesion around the sense of community in all of these very successful firms that meant, for instance, that managers were typically chosen for advancement from within and that they succeeded through generational flow of members and considered themselves as stewards of the long-term value of the enterprise and that they put the health of the institution as a whole first. In fact, they were also tolerant or what's considered today to be decentralized. And in fact, that they were particularly tolerant of activities at the margin, outliers, experiments, and eccentricities. So without, again, these kinds of risk-taking activities, uh, you won't change and you will sort of fall back like GM and like Kodak and others. And in fact, the last thing is that they are very interestingly conservative in financing. So they find that th these are companies that could grasp opportunities without first having to convince third party financiers of their attractiveness because they have reserves. So they keep some of their profits for future uses. Okay, that's the status quo. What are the alternatives? That's what I will spend the rest of the talk on. I think one of the most interesting developments we've seen in recent years is the shift away from the model of absentee ownership, as uh, Tosin Veblen and others have called it, towards more uh, what Marilyn Philippi has called corporate territorial responsibility, so that companies are involved in the communities where they are located physically. And one of these concepts, of course, is steward ownership, which has been promoted, for instance, by the Purpose Foundation, which is promoting purpose companies all over the world. And they say that steward ownership is a corporate ownership structure that presents an alternative to shareholder value primacy. It ensures that companies prioritize their long-term purpose over short-term profits by legally enshrining two principles, self-determination and purpose orientation. And then they have developed some various models as to how this can be realized in practice, and it has been realized. One of them is a double foundation where there are two legal entities 
one that holds the control rights and managers functioning as stewards for the company, and the second charitable organization holds economic rights and the capital shares of the company. Bosch in Germany, Patagonia in the United States recently, and Globus also in Germany. There are others like Mozilla that also have similar structures. Uh, there's the single uh, foundation model, which has all voting rights and economic rights in one self-governing nonprofit foundation, Novo Nordisk in uh, Denmark, Zeiss in Germany, Carlsberg, Märkisches Landbrot, and Elobau in Germany are all examples of, of these, uh, this single foundation model. I don't know what's going on with my slides, a little bit messed up. It was yes yesterday, it was the same. Um, we have also the Vido share model, which has a 1% golden share by a nonprofit entity. That means that this company can veto any changes, for instance, in the bylaw. Um, there are a few of those companies like Ecosia and Wild Plastic in Germany, Tullus Russell in the UK, Share Tribe in Finland. Uh, Share Tribe is an interesting company that's trying to basically pr present markets to, uh, they're, they're trying to create market or lower the bar for creating marketplaces for communities, for entrepreneurs. So if you want to create some kind of, I don't know, Airbnb, local type of marketplace, they will help and facilitate the, 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 the digital expertise and competence in, in creating those interesting company. Um, so there's also the Perpetual uh, Purpose Trust, which is a US innovation that exists in the United States. And again, this is a company that doesn't serve a certain uh, uh, a person, but it serves a, a purpose. And so the trustees control the trust, but again, they are required to uh, basically serve that purpose and not extract profit. So there are a few of those companies as well here. Uh, you have um, research by Batisin and co-authors that find that synthetic structures, in fact, can be more uh, effective with respect to governance. So if you don't just have ownership concentrated in one family or in one class, but you have several different types of owners that, in fact, these, these companies are more effective in the governance, probably due to the diversity of different perspectives that are coming in. And there are, in fact, more jurisdictions that are merging these types of legislation. So, for instance, in, in Valencia, they allow, uh, which in Spain, there are, you know, the autonomous regions have different, different legal architecture. So, Valencia allows cooperatives to actually sell 49% a non-controlling stake of shares to outside investors in order to bridge the capital gap, basically. And you have similar models elsewhere. And in Belgium, of course, you had the social purpose company prior to the 2019 reform of the company law. And since then, you've had now basically the ability for companies to include a purpose in their, in their bylaws. Any company can now do it. You don't have to be a specific kind of company, but any company can include a, a purpose in its, in its bylaws here. Another example is in the United States. I think one of the most interesting examples is very well studied, by the way, of course, it's longstanding, is the ESOP, the Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Uh, this is... Everybody knows how dysfunctional the United States is. I mean, <laughs> you've not had a government there now in the legislature for weeks. I think they have one now, maybe. Let's see how long it lasts. But the ESOP has outlasted many, many different governments and many different parties. A very interesting phenomenon. So it was developed by Lewis Kelso actually in the 1950s. In one particular case, it was a newspaper. Uh, the owner of the newspaper wanted to retire and he facilitated the workers taking over, the employees taking over the newspaper and generalized the model. And there was legislation passed in the 1970s to basically give tax advantages to these companies. So Kelso, very interesting guy who wasn't an academic. He was more of an entrepreneur. He also was, I think, a bit of a, an investor, a banker. He founded a commercial bank as well. But he developed this notion of binary economics, binary looking at capital and labor, so suggesting that the value function or the production of value is dependent on these and the interaction between these two factors and saying that as technological change occurs, basically tools, the tools that we use become more and more productive, that they're producing more and more value, whereas the labor input is basically staying the same. And for him, this means that as labor progressively produces less and capital progressively produces more of the gross national product, a growing proportion of all households must participate in production through the ownership of capital and a diminishing number must depend on the earnings of the earnings of their labor. So he was actually against full employment. He suggested actually we should distribute the ownership of capital more equitably in order to uh, actually have a functioning society. So the ESOP, the Employee Stock Ownership plan 
It's a retirement plan, actually, but it involves a company selling shares to a trust held in the name of the employees. And they, the employees have individual trust accounts and they are tax deductible and the employees do not pay taxes on these accounts until they, they retire or leave the company, so when they withdraw the funds. The uh, pension plan, it's a, ben it's a pension plan for workers and at the same time, it is a form of beneficial ownership. So the tax advantages are only available to companies that have at least 30% ownership by the ESOP. So you can't just have it, you know, uh, as a nominal uh, thing. So it has to have a large share of the company before there is a, the tax advantage. So that's an incentive for companies not to just put their foot in the water, but to really get involved. And in fact, today there are over 6,500 firms that are ESOPs and they employ more than 14 million people across the United States. As you see here, the distribution is quite broad. And it's been supported, as I mentioned, by both Democratic and Republican, uh, uh, I almost said regimes, uh, governments. Um, so it started, I think, during the, the Carter years and Reagan also supported it and so on. So it's very interesting how you get different uh, uh, people across the political spectrum to, to support such things. And just to talk about this binary economics, you do see a decline in labor, in the growth of labor productivity over time. This is from Aaron Beninev's book on automation, very interesting book by Verso Press which he attributes to the lack of investment in, in capital as deindustrialization occurred. However it's happening, there is a decline in the growth of labor productivity. So perhaps what Kelso is saying is not so far from the truth. Oops, that's not where it's supposed to be. <laughs> okay, anyway, so something's wrong with the slides. So a similar phenomenon in the UK is the so-called employee ownership trust which is basically the brainchild of, um, of uh, Graham Nuttall, very fine gentleman. And he developed this uh, Nuttall report in 2012, where he said, giving all workers a greater stake in the company they work for is a powerful way of aligning the interests of employees with that of the business. A worker who has a financial and personal stake in the company will take more responsibility for its success. The evidence shows that this is reflected in the economic strength of such companies, lower absenteeism, a happier workforce, and less staff turnover, higher profitability. These companies also tend to be more resilient through tough economic times. So this was from the report that not all was commissioned to write in 2012. As a um, consequence of that report in 2014, the government, I guess then of uh, David Cameron, passed the Finance Act of that year, which provided tax benefits to owners selling their firm to a beneficial trust held in the name of the, of the employees. And of course, this was also promulgated by the Employee Ownership Association uh, that's, that's very much involved in, in, uh, in, in information gathering on these and, and, and basically networking these, 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 these firms. So the trust is managed by a trustee who's acting, who's required to act on the interests of the employees. And it in fact allows uh, companies to be purchased via a combination of future profits and external financing. So it is an example of a leveraged buyout. By the way, the ESOP model that I mentioned before is also is not necessarily leveraged, but it, there is a leveraged option for it as well. And of course, this campaign has been combined with uh, education of lawyers, wealth advisors, accountants, and so on, because if they don't know about it, they won't recommend it. So I spoke with uh, a number, I did a case study of the, of the situation of such uh, firms in the UK, and I found out that many Owners of companies are very interested in including their, their employees in the ownership, in management, but that their advisors, uh, they are against it or they, they don't know about it. And if you don't know about it, then you're not going to recommend it. So it's very good that the Employee Ownership Association actually has been very active in promoting education on these alternatives. And in fact, I think this is one of the most interesting things that's happened in recent years. There's a, a report that just came out this week by the Employee Ownership Association studying the ecosystem of these trusts. And it finds that there's an annual growth rate of 67% of these firms uh, since 2014. So that means that actually over half of the employee ownership trusts that have been created have been created in the last two years. So it's, it's very popular. And they are eight to 12% more productive than non-employee owned firms. And they're 50% more likely to invest in R&D and in fact, they only make up 0.1% of total firms in the UK. They're growing very fast, so probably more in a few years, but they already make up 
quite more than that of the uh, value added and the economic activity in the UK. So they're very productive firms that are serving, again, the community, uh, the people, the society and the economy, and one can say the environment as well. So it's a sense of extended corporate governance. And this is the report. I mean, there's lots of these very interesting models that are, that are popping up everywhere. Another one is in Slovenia. There's the Institute for Economic Democracy that has developed the so-called European ESOP. Again, the European Employee Stock Ownership Plan. It actually just won an award, uh, the Award for Social Innovation from, I forget which organization. And it attempts to take the best practices of the ESOP model and the EOT model and actually to improve upon it, as they suggest. Uh, and the improvements that they talk about are that the shares that they are that are purchased by the trust are continuously repurchased to provide a better incentive and to repurchase and repurchase liability to ensure a more equitable distribution of risk. So basically, it's a revolving it's a revolving uh, it's a revolving trust. So the point the difference in the e, to the ESOP model is the ESOP model is it's a retirement plan. So you only take them out when you retire, and most workers, even young people, are not thinking about that now. So in this sense, that the, the fact that they are continuously repurchased ensures that there's an automatic mechanism uh, that prevents, so to speak, those who ha have bought in early from maintaining basically their ownership, whereas those who come in later are excluded. So, and secondly, the legal entity of the ESOP trust is in this case, it's not a trust, but it's a cooperative. Uh, which of course means that it's, it's a democratic institution, one member, one vote, and so on. So uh, this can actually uh, basically ensure that, again, the richer employees or managers don't have more, so to speak, voice in this institution. So it's, I think it's a very interesting phenomenon that is getting the ear of, of the European institutions at the moment, the EU, the European Investment Bank and others are very interested in this phenomenon. And they have, again, the rollover, as I mentioned, that means that uh, the company continues to make contributions to this employee ownership cooperative, even after the uh, external debt is paid off. So it's, a, again, a leverage buyout. Um, and the contributions then are used to finance a program of continuous repurchases of shares. So for when, excuse me, when you leave the company, the, the cooperative rebuys your share. So you're no longer a member, you get the money, and the next person has a chance. And there is an example here of INIA, which is a, uh, it's a firm of about 100 employees. They work on automation systems and they are um, quite successful. It's one of the 100 biggest exporters of the Slovenian economy. And of course, they were very interested in this model to begin with, but they are 100% now employee-owned company that have used this European ESOP model. Uh, France, as I mentioned, has the um, profit sharing system, uh, participation, it's called. Above and beyond that, there is the FCPE, the Fonds Commune du Placement d'Entreprise, which, uh, by the way, it's not right that it's mandatory. What is mandatory is participation. Uh, so this refers to participation. It's mandatory for large companies to engage in profit sharing, which involves three months of annual remuneration per annum that are reserved for the employee's account. So, I mean, there are companies like um, Renault, the automaker, I think 4% of the companies owned by the employees, which has been accumulated over time. And you have to think about how big these companies are in terms of valuation and how little an employee uh, makes and can then reserve for ownership. So it's quite a significant share, quite a significant stake. And of course, many companies have used the FCPU uh, to promote uh, profit sharing. So 90% of uh, companies in France, as you see, it's the, the highest in Europe. And by the way, Belgium is quite low. <laughs> well, where's Belgium? This is Belgium, it's quite low. <laughs> so 90% of companies have profit sharing in France, 40% have employee ownership. So it's quite a, uh, in that sense, inclusive model of, of, of um, entrepreneurship. And there are even firms that uh, specialize in facilitating the employee ownership of firms by offering leverage, by offering equity, equality capital. I was just speaking with one of the employees today. They are doing, I think there are 400, he mentioned, um, leverage buyouts in France a year. 
And Equalis is doing about 25 to 30 of these with the FCPU, which includes employees. So the rate is increasing. So as more people find out about these phenomena, I think there will be more interest in, in these types of companies. So there is Lezel. Oops. Lezel uh, is, uh, is, a, is a company in, in um, Lorraine. It's uh, Lothringen, we say in German. <laughs> but uh, they produce windows and doors. Very successful company, and they are in the middle of nowhere. So the, the, the manager of the company, uh, Laurent is his name, uh, I was in an event uh, some months ago, he mentioned that this is a great draw. Why would highly skilled workers come to live in the wilderness? Well, because they have a stake in the company. You are an owner of the company, so you are an integral member of the company. So again, it's a, it's a way to give back to the stakeholders who, who make the, the value, create the value of the company. So Belgium, as I mentioned, a little bit different situation. The share of uh, ownership in companies by top executives in Belgium, in fact, increased by 400% uh, in, in recent years. No? The share of workers uh, who have an ownership stake in companies has maintained, remained relatively flat. There is uh, actually quite low transparency even in executive earnings in Belgium. It's one of the, the worst countries in terms of the statistics. You see it's uh, Serbia, only Serbia is worse in Europe, unfortunately. Uh, but there is no strong legislation and nevertheless the rate of companies that have some form of employee stock ownership or uh, profit sharing is increasing, is increasing. So it's, a, it's over 20%, so profit sharing is a little bit over 20% at 2015, and uh, the employee stock ownership is a bit, bit over a quarter. There is also the Brasero system in Wallonia, which allows cooperatives, members of cooperatives, to basically invest in their company and the funds are matched up to 200,000 euros by Valoni Alternative. And uh, in the Flemish region, you are finding there is a cooperation between Febe Coop and the Flemish regional government in promoting entrepreneurs selling their companies to their workers. So here you see, you know, who can you find your workers to, to take over the company? So there are some uh, alternative, I would say, models of firm succession that are becoming more evident in Belgium as well. But it can be more. And this is where I come to the role of sovereign wealth funds. They are in a unique position. I mean, this is the share SFPI. SFPI is the sovereign wealth fund of Belgium. They have a long-term orientation and a public mandate. It means that they can and should act in ways that a normal market actor cannot. And as public entities, they can in fact leverage their position to engage in pioneer work and steering activities aimed at balancing long-term benefit with short-term returns. And they can send signals to other market actors, you know, this is what you should be doing. And Thomas Piketty, as you know, has uh, worked on this R greater G factor for some time. If the rate of return on capital is greater than the rate of growth of the economy, inequality is growing. And so, in fact, by extending share ownership more broadly, this does not have to be the case. If broad society owns shares in firms, then the rate of growth can be as, if capital can be as high as it wants to be, people are all going to benefit. This is a very interesting article in the Financial Times by Chris Mackin, saying that sovereign wealth funds can choose a different investment path. And I will just, here is the, the final uh, closing passage at a time when concerns about economic inequality are rising, some politicians are pushing redistributive after the fact taxation as the only possible solution. We should consider more innovative and inclusive options that share wealth as it is being created. So he says, sovereign wealth funds are part of the contemporary economic conversation. If they continue to rely on traditional investment practices, they will become increasingly vulnerable to charges that they are opportunistically extracting value across borders. It is time for them to explore a different path that shares value with corporate managers, engineers, and workers within the nation states where these funds invest. All that is required is the will to act. Very interesting article from, from 2019. So, 
the Purpose Foundation I mentioned before talks about the challenges towards creating more steward ownership companies. And they say that the path towards steward ownership is still hilly. As a result, there are not enough steward-owned companies out there to fully realize the potential of this legal form due to a lack of information and narratives, the complexity of the legal implementation, and a lack of aligned capital. So obviously, a company like SFPI can bridge the gap at least by providing more capital to these kinds of transitions. So I had kind of developed the idea of a mission-oriented framework for the SFPI uh, yesterday. To return to this, this is the sequel. Uh, Belgian company law does allow for companies, as I mentioned, to have this explicit mission since 2019. And therefore, it should be a minimum requirement of the SFPI to have in its portfolio companies that it is investing in for them to introduce a proactive mission to achieve the SDGs in and as far as they are able to do so, with milestones, of course, that could be, could be audited, so it should not just be blah, blah. Or, I mean, this is especially for new companies, or for existing companies to have a science-based transition plan in its bylaws or commitment to their... So again, if 20% or more than 20% of Belgian companies have profit sharing or employee stock ownership, SFPI can introduce this into its investee reporting. Companies can, do you employ profit sharing? It's a simple question. If you want our money, do you, do you employ this? It's information. And in fact, as I mentioned, it's one of the worst countries for reporting on top executive compensation. I didn't know that. Uh, it should force companies that it invests in to report on these aspects because this, in, this is involved with issues like inequality. It's very important. To me, these are, these are minimum standards. And it can be a source of patient capital for facilitating a type of EOT model or similar models uh, in Belgium. And as I mentioned, wherever there is leverage, there is external finance. So the SFPI can, in fact, find symbiotic relationships. It can have some kind of a benefit. Again, investing in companies with a profitable outlook, certainly, but having those companies convert into more equitably owned institutions, it's, it's certainly possible. And of course, the EU, I mean, sometimes, you know, in some countries you say, well, if the EU is doing it, we will also do it. The EU is looking into this policy. The European Investment Bank is looking into these things. So this is, this is, so to speak, where the economy is heading. This is where things are going. And the federal parliament the, mandated the SFPI to create a Fonds de Transformation, I think with 250 million euros. This can be part of the activities to transform the Belgian economy into more sustainable footing. And certainly I commit myself and I would hope my successor, if there is a successor, should use the share SFPI should be used to develop policy and legal mechanisms for creating, for instance, the Belgian FCPE or a Belgian EOT or a Belgian uh, ESOP or however you want to put it. And that's it. Thank you.